Good morning everyone. It's a chilly Tuesday here in Adelaide so I hope you're all staying warm and uh, my name is Jessica Allen. Uh, I work for Suho in the Adelaide office and today we're going to be talking a little bit about air tightness so if you don't know anything about it you're in the right place. Um, this webinar is eligible for one Green Star Sustainable Development CPD point so any of you GSAPs out there please feel free to log onto your portal and apply for credit. Um, just ask a few questions in the chat if you're out there live and we can send you a certificate of attendance. Um, so just email at info at suho.com.au if you're after that. So today we're going to cover some basics about air tightness testing. Um, we're going to cover what is it, what happens during a test, what are the benefits of going after a more airtight building envelope, a little bit about bushfire resilience um, given the bushfire season we've just had. Um, I'm sure it's fresh in everyone's memories. Uh, the little bit about what's happened under the new uh, National Construction Code and a little bit about Green Star as well. So we should be here for about half an hour. There'll be some time for Q&A at the end. Um, please add your questions in the chat while I'm talking. I'll come over to the chat at the end of this and answer your questions. I probably won't be able to do it while I'm talking um, because I'm focusing on this screen here. But at the end, we'll get to the questions if there are any. So what is blower door testing? Blower door testing is a way of putting a number on the amount of air moving through the building fabric that shouldn't be. So we're not referring to ventilation in this case. We're not talking about uh, doors and windows and whether or not you should open them. Um, people often get a little bit worried when we talk about air tightness and they think they're going to suffocate inside their house and that's not the case at all. What we're trying to do is make sure that there isn't any air leaking out of, in or out of the building fabric um, that shouldn't be whilst all your doors and windows are shut and your heating and cooling is on trying to keep you comfortable. Um, your home website is quite a good resource, www.yourhome.gov.au I think it is, um, and, and they say that 15 to 25 percent of winter heat loss within homes occurs via air leakage. So air leakage is the uncontrolled movement of air through the unintentional cracks and gaps in the roof walls and floor of a building. So the key word here is uncontrolled. Um, and the gaps and cracks aren't meant to be there. So don't get confused between what your house needs in order to be ventilated and air leakage. They're two very separate things. Ventilation is very important, but um, it needs to be deliberate. So during a typical test, um, we bring equipment to site, such as this picture on the left. This is a one fan test. We don't only usually need one fan for a house. As the buildings get larger, we need more equipment, depending on how leaky they are. So the number of fans that we bring to site, the number of doors, the number of hoses, all of that stuff, that is all determined by an estimate on how leaky we think the building is, combined with the size of the building. So these fans are all installed in temporary frames on the external walls and then when we turn them on they either ex ex um, exert negative or positive pressure on the building envelope. We take the building to 50 pascals. That means that there is a 50 pascals pressure difference between inside the building and the outside atmosphere and that can either be 50 pascals less inside under negative pressure or 50 pascals more inside under positive pressure. The readings that um, the fan takes, so there's all these different hoses and things connected up to the gauges and the fan. They take pressure readings and flow readings, airflow readings, and all of that information is then pumped through to the laptop. Um, so you can see the top graph there is what typically, uh, the, the software that we use is the Energy, Energy Conservatory. There are different brands of fans out there, but this is what the software for my particular brand of fans looks like. Um, the top graph is the results of a multi-fan test. I think we use three fans in this test. Um, the red are the fan pressure readings and the green are the building envelope readings. But anyway, that's a bit too technical. We won't go across that today. Um, the bottom graph is the readings on a one fan test. So there's only one set of data being plotted on a um, leakage curve. Finding the leaks is quite an enjoyable task. Um, well, I think it's quite fun. So um, there are lots of different places that you can find leaks in a typical home or commercial building. This image is also taken off the Your Home website and um, it's a typical older 
house so in newer houses there probably won't be as many leaks as what this image shows although sometimes you can be surprised so um, we've got a timber floor here which is a really big contributing factor um, if you don't if your house isn't on a concrete slab if it's on if it's on stumps then um, your floor will probably leak quite a lot um, this house has got a chimney it's got some of those permanent vents that used to be built into older homes older solid brick homes um, it's got um, doors and windows obviously and then any electrical and plumbing penetrations so exhaust fans uh, tap the air conditioner and then of course any of the junctions where the materials join so floor wall junctions um, wall roof ceiling junctions um, anywhere where two materials have to be joined together in some way um, vented skylights are another one so this picture is just kind of a snapshot of where we typically look and the way we find the leaks there's a few different ways um, the first one we use is just our hands we go around and feel at all the junctions all around the windows um, anywhere that we typically would find under sinks where the plumbing penetrations are uh, behind fridges um, those sorts of things we go around with our hand and we feel for them um, the other way that we use is thermal imaging so this picture here is an image of a exhaust fan or a downlight I can't remember which one I think it's an exhaust fan because there's a fair amount of air coming out of that under negative pressure so when we depressurize the building and suck it out of it it then draws air in all the gaps and cracks in the house that shouldn't be there so um, this is an example of an exhaust fan that doesn't have a damper on it so under negative pressure air is coming up through the roof space and it's just streaming through into the house so the purple is the cold air and air leakage under thermal under thermal imaging under thermal imaging looks like paint splashes. So it looks like there's someone's just thrown a bucket of paint on the ceiling. Um, then the third way is we use smoke. So this is just one small example of um, a small, very airtight cabin. This was about three air changes. This cabin it was very well constructed, um, portable. Uh, accommodation and so you have to look pretty hard to find leaks in these sorts of places and this one here we just use a smoke, small smoke pen to sh put a visual on the air leak and we, the air leak is quite common yeah. at power points so there are ways there are ways that you can stop that from happening there's little fittings you can put on the back of the all your, all your power points um, but in this instance and in most instances penetrations go through the wall up and, and then the air pathway goes up into the roof space and it's just all free-flowing air so it's something that most people don't think about uh, but it's quite interesting if you've got 15 20 power points in your house that's an air leakage pathway that you can't control unless you've got those little child-proof plugs um, so these are some thermal images that we've taken of a house under negative pressure. The top two are during a blow or test. The top left is an air conditioning vent. So you can see the paint splash marks are quite significant in that one. The top right is a window. So behind that architrave, you can see some pretty big purple streaks. This house was a seven and a half star house built about 10 years ago in a sustainable development north of Adelaide. And when we went to blow a door test this house, we found that the, the clients called us and they said that they were experiencing, like they were cold during winter and they wanted to sort of figure out if they could do anything about it. And um, we went and tested the house and every single one of their windows leaked like this from top and bottom. So what happens is painters get a little bit lazy with the areas that they know that people aren't going to be looking at. So you can't see up top of a window you generally don't look underneath the architraves and they might forget to put the silicon on there or something like that um, also the construction inside the wall won't have been an airtight construction more than likely 10 years ago um, so the seven and a half stars that this building got in the energy model probably didn't convert to that in real life because of the way the building was constructed um, we took some, I had a tradesman with me on the day and we went around and fixed up some significant air leaks in their place with just some really basic materials, silicon door seals, um, a couple of exhaust fan dampers that you can buy from Bunnings for $35. 
and um, we ended up halving their air leakage from 12 to 6 in a matter of an hour and a half. So it was a very simple, inexpensive exercise and I called them, um, I kept track of them the following winter and they said that they did feel more comfortable. It was a bit hard to put a, num like a, a, a number on it, um, but they did say that they felt a difference in the comfort of their home downstairs. So um, that's that was a really positive outcome. Um, the two bottom images are not air leakage related, but it's also part of the audit service that is carried out when we do a blow or test. So the bottom left image is um, the ceiling, and that is a missing insulation bat above a downlight. So what commonly happens is electricians will come through and do their wiring, and they'll move bats out the way to do their job, and then they won't put them back again, or they won't make contact with the ceiling. So these downlights, um, obviously you have to make sure they're fire rated, and they've got the, the covers on them before you put insulation on top of a downlight. But um, these downlights were all fire rated, had fire rated covers on them. It just meant that the trades sometimes interfere with each other's work. So you can have one trade who does the right thing and then someone comes in behind them and messes things around and the performance of the house, the thermal performance of the house suffers as a result. So in this instance, some houses have got 30, 40 downlights in them. So if the insulation is disturbed above each one or even half of them, then the R value and the insulation properties of your insulation is going to be significantly reduced. So this is something that's invisible unless you get up in your roof space and most people won't do that. Um, so the thermal imaging is really useful at uncovering um, defects like this and we've had clients, um, builder clients who've gone and got all of their supervisors um, thermal imaging cameras to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen uh, on their projects. So that's a really positive thing as well. Um, the bottom right image is a steel frame. So you can see that there's quite a lot of heat transfer coming through that steel frame. Um, a lot of thermal bridging, so cold and heat from outside is being transferred directly to the internal surfaces and that will be radiating inside the house. So that's a bit of a separate issue, not related to air tightness, but also significantly impacts the comfort of the home. And also has some um, knock-on effects with moisture depending on the indoor conditions. The red pen test is something that anyone who does an air tightness test will carry out on your building. Um, anyone who knows anything about air tightness bangs on about this. So it's not actually a test in the same way that a blower door test is a physical test. It's simply an exercise that you do. The pen doesn't have to be red. It can be pink, purple, green, doesn't matter. It's simply an exercise in identifying your air barrier. So it's um, you get your floor plan and your section drawings. They can be digital on your computer. You can have them on a physical piece of paper on your desk. And you draw a line around the external walls and roof and floor. Um, this line generally follows the thermal barrier. So the air barrier and thermal barrier are generally the same thing, not always, but generally. So it excludes car parking areas um, and plant rooms and basically any unconditioned area in a, in a building. The red line goes in between the conditioned and unconditioned spaces. So there is a specification that some colleagues and I wrote a couple of years ago, and I always forget to find the link. Let me find it. And I'll pop it in the chat. If anybody wants to have a look, um, that link will help you to identify to your project team that you want an air tightness test done and what they are aiming for and what happens on the day. So as you can see here, the red line goes in between the garage and the house. So obviously this identifies to your trades because designers and architects and energy assessors can say all they want and put the specification in the drawings and, and you know, plan until the cows come home. But if the trades on site don't know where the air barrier is and don't know that a test is being done, they won't pay the attention to detail that's required. So this red line is really important just to make up part of the plan set so that anybody on site understands what's going on and knows they need to pay attention to those areas. 
Um, depending on the level of detail, there might also be detail drawings they need to follow in order to achieve the airtightness result that the client is after. You can be, have very detailed strategies and not so detailed strategies. It just depends on the, what the client wants. Um, so before we come to site to do a test, we work out the envelope area. So it's just a little bit of a information on how we work out the results. This dark green section here is what we call the envelope area. So that's the square meterage added up of all the walls, floors and ceilings. Um, the volume of the building is the light green, obviously. Um, air tightness can be converted into different scores using the envelope area and the volume. It depends on who you're talking to and what kind of test you're doing. Um, but generally envelope area, we use this green, dark green area here to convert the to convert the test into a result that makes sense. Um, there are a few different types of tests that can be done, particularly on large complex commercial buildings. So if you're interested in Green Star, um, I go into this in more detail in my Green Star webinar, which I'm not not going specifically into that this week, although I'm doing a case study later in the week on a test that was done earlier this year. So, um, but you can go into our video library and look up the previous Green Star webinars I've done and this will ex there's a little bit more detail in there about the different types of tests and why, what the pros and cons are. So a whole building test on the left is the, really the only way to get an accurate result for a whole building. Um, pressurizing all of the external surfaces is the best way to get a number. Um, the middle section, the middle image is a compartment test where only a small portion of the building is being tested. This is the most common kind of test that clients want when they're getting a large building done because their perception is that if they get the whole building done, it's going to be more expensive and more complicated and take longer than to do a smaller compartment test and that's not necessarily true. These compartment tests in complex office buildings are complex because of all the rises and ducting that need to be excluded and um, temp uh, temporarily sealed off. So this kind of test is actually probably, depending on the building, can be more complicated than doing a whole building test. It also doesn't give you a number that makes any sense. So this picture here. Um, what we're testing is the entire envelope area. We're testing the external surfaces, not internal surfaces. So if you're testing a small compartment, then you're also testing what's leaking between levels or between rooms. And that's not what we care about in air times. We care about the integrity of the external air barrier. So what, re what leaks into the next room or the floor above you is irrelevant, but it means that if you're pressurizing just this level, then the air that's being pushed in or sucked from um, external zones is being quantified in the flow measurements that the gauges and the fans are reading. So it means that your internal leakage is being counted, which means that the numbers won't make any sense because we don't care what leaks internally. So the numbers from a test like this, unfortunately, are completely irrelevant. The information you can get from a test like this, such as just the qualitative investigation feeling, thermal camera imaging, smoke um, smoke machines and smoke pens. That sort of detective work is quite interesting, it's quite enjoyable. Um, so it's a very valuable exercise in terms of finding out exactly where the air pathways are or attempting to find out where air pathways are, um, but the numbers that you get are, don't make any sense at all and are not usable. A guarded or co-pressurization test is very similar to this compartment test where you're testing only a small portion of a building, but you're also co-pressurizing the neighboring zones, which means this, so the green zone is the test zone and the red zone is the co-pressurization or guard zone. So that means that both of these zones are pressurized to, to say 50 pascals, they're pressurized to the, to the same level and that the internal leakage is then cancelled out, it's neutralized. So. If for some reason you, you it's not possible to test a whole building, for example, very large hospitals, it's often impossible to test the whole thing. Um, these smaller guarded tests are an excellent way of testing a, a smaller portion whilst getting numbers that you can use. 
So the benefits of improved tightness are many. So obviously, if you're not having your conditioned air leaking out of gaps and, crack, gaps and cracks in the walls and floor and roof that shouldn't be there, you're not going to be having to pump as much energy into your house to keep it, or your building to keep it hot or cold, hot or warm or cool. Um, so there's that. Um, you're also going to be more comfortable, uh, you know, less drafts. Um, the internal temperature will stay stable for longer. Healthier indoor air quality, so in, in areas of high pollution in cities, um, you're not getting any of the pollutants from outside coming into the built into your into your in, your conditioned environment. Um, there's the flip side of that where you can actually trap pollutants inside a house. So going back to my first slide where I was talking about the difference between air leakage and ventilation. Um, you, if you're going to create an airtight structure, then it's very important to ventilate it as well. Depending on the level that you go to, there is a certain threshold where it's really important that you have mechanical ventilation. That threshold is about a permeability of about three or three air changes and permeability are somewhat interchangeable depending on context, but the level is about a permeability of about three before you need mechanical ventilation. Um, because obviously you don't want to trap pollutants or uh, inside, you don't want to upset the physics of the building inside and if you have a very airtight structure that can happen. So it's very important to understand the consequences before you achieve, before you plan to, to create an airtight structure. <coughs> Excuse me. Reduce more particle infiltration so anyone with allergies will suffer less. Reduced moisture infiltration. Um, when air enters a building, it brings moisture with it. So um, you won't have the same level of moisture and mold risk with an airtight structure, depending on your ventilation strategy as well. Excuse me. Optical, optimal mechanical heat recovery ventilation performance. If you are using a heat recovery ventilation system in your building, it needs to be an airtight structure because if it's not an airtight structure then it means that the internal temperature won't be as stable and when the cool air comes in from outside for example and it's um, swapping over with the warm air there isn't as much warm air to recover and heat up that cold air because it's simply leaking out of the gaps and cracks that shouldn't be there so if you're going to use a heat recovery ventilation system you have to be able to control your internal conditions um, and obviously these are little friends down the bottom um, less of these. So my house is a brick veneer 1980s home and I get all of these little friends coming into my house at various times of the year. Um, my house is about, I tested my house and it's about a 12. So um, 12 air changes per hour. So um, it's, it's too leaky obviously for my liking because these guys come in all the gaps and cracks that shouldn't be there. Goodness knows where they are. I shudder to think but they're all getting in. So if you want to keep these guys out, then air tightness is obviously um, a good idea. Bushfire resilience. So um, a few months back when we were all going through the bushfire disaster, um, I had a friend in Canberra who wrote this post. So on the left, this is a Facebook post by a friend of mine. Um, she said, after a brief respite, the smoke is on its way back. Time to take the doors and windows again. So her home, her doors and windows weren't doing a good enough job keeping the smoke out of their home and she had a small baby so this was very stressful for her and her and her husband went around madly taping the house up to keep the smoke out. I'm sure she wasn't the only family um, in the, within the fire, bushfire areas that was doing that either. Um, another article that, was, that I found in the Canberra Times, a gentleman named Jonathan Milford said that it's a little bit less smoky inside than out but not too much less smoky talking about his house so this story I'm sure was being repeated all across the, the bushfire zones where people were being impacted so it's not obviously it's obviously not just the fire front that affects people it smoke travels a long way <clears throat> so improved air tightness is going to protect you from smoke in a bushfire season it also protects you from ember attack so Ember attack, I don't know if you've ever seen drone footage of a paddock where there'll be spot fires or one house will have burnt down and in the middle of a green field. Um, that house obviously wasn't in the fire front. That house 
was attacked, was a subject to an ember attack. So embers can travel a really long way. According to the bushfirefoundation.org, they can travel up to about 40 kilometres, um, starting fires well ahead of the fire front. So an air tightness strategy isn't going to stop your house from burning down if you're in the fire front or if you haven't addressed your fuel load around your house. But what it will reduce is the risk of embers settling into little nooks and crannies and igniting. So embers typically get in around gutters, under doorways, through cracks around window frames, gaps in roof spaces and under the floor. So if an ember, for example, settles in a window frame and starts to ignite, there's usually curtains behind that window. And once the curtains go up in flames, you can see how a fire would very quickly take hold. So <clears throat> um, addressing the air tightness of a building is going to reduce the risk of being subject to these sorts of fires. Um, AS3959, which is the construction in a bushfire zone Australian standard, directly addresses combustibility of materials and other types of building ceilings such as vents and weep holes and um, uh, exhaust fans. They have to have a certain cover over them. Um, but it doesn't address air tightness specifically. There's some requirements around seals on garage doors and things like that, but it there's no, it probably could do a lot more. So my hope is that perhaps in a, in a iteration that's coming soon, that perhaps a blow door test might be included for bushfire zones. Um, that would be very sensible. <coughs> so this graph on the right is from research that was done five years ago by the CSIRO. They did a research project that spanned the country. So they went to all the capital cities and they tested about 130 houses for air tightness. And these houses were no more than four years old. They were all new homes. And this graph plots the results. So you can see Melbourne, Perth and Sydney had quite a few outliers here. Um, Perth in particular had quite a broad range in air tightness. Once you get above 20 air changes, I mean, that is extremely leaky. And unless the house has been deliberately designed with, I don't know, louvers or no walls maybe, um, you should not be getting these results. Um, 15 was the average. 15.4 air changes was the Australian average. Here in South Australia, we're doing quite well. But Melbourne, which is climate zone 6, I can't imagine how cold these people must be. Um, it's quite a worry. So across the country, 15.4 air changes per hour at 50 pascals was the average result. Um, in comparison, the gold standard for residential air tightness is 0 0.6 air changes. So that's a big difference. And you don't have to, 0 0.6 air changes is obviously, you know, the creme de la creme. You don't have to achieve that in order to be a lot more comfortable. Um, that level of air tightness requires a very specific detailed design strategy. The building code is um, probably a more realistic aim. So on the 1st of May 2020, we were the, um, South Australia, um, Victoria, Tasmania and the ACT. Um, the other states have got their own frameworks around energy compliance. Um, but those states and territories transferred over to the building to the NCC 2019. And in, 20, in NCC 2019, there is some requirements around air tightness testing for commercial and residential buildings. Um, the commercial requirements are a little bit confusing. Depending on the class of building and the climate zone, they need to require, they need to achieve different air tightness targets. So that's just some wording in there around what's required. We have to go by the Australian standard um, 9972 which is a pretty much a direct copy of the international standard for air tightness testing. Residential uh, targets are much more simple. You just have to get a permeability of 10. So I keep talking about permeability and air changes. They're just different ways to measure air tightness based on either envelope area or volume of the house or building. Um, <clears throat> different different organisations refer to different metrics, so it, it gets a bit confusing. Um, but the score of 10 air changes is approximately, or permeability of 10 is approximately the same as 10 air changes in a residential setting. So they're, yeah, don't worry about too much. They're about the same in a house. 
Um, <clears throat> Green Star has got an air tightness um, credit underneath, under their commissioning section. So typically the type of building that I test is an air conditioned office building. So these are the targets that typically the buildings I test have to get. A target of a permeability of 20 is, like I said in this slide here, um, once you get up to this level of air tightness or leakiness, I should say, um, that's quite leaky. So if you're if you are looking at a green star project and you're a little bit apprehensive about getting a test done because you have no idea what it is and whether or not your building will achieve it, um, don't be super concerned. Most buildings will achieve one point. Not all, but one. Just remember to get a whole building test done because the compartment tests don't make any sense. Even though, talk about this in the green star presentation, but all of this mumbo jumbo here tells you you can do a compartment test. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, so you need to hire a suitably qualified practitioner to do that test. And on the ATMA website, which stands for the Air Tightness Testing and Measurement Association, you can find all the people that you can hire to do a test such as this. So let me get that and I'll put it in the chat again. There we go. Oh, I thought this website having dramas but this should still work at my org members so <clears throat> this is where you go to find a suitably qualified practitioner now there's some information here about the different levels of tester um, all the different names and where they are located their accreditation number and what they are accredited to do so there is a there's about 50 of us across the country and there is a very broad range of skills and experience in that list. So <clears throat> here we are. So make sure when you do approach somebody um, that you do your due diligence and find out what their experience is before you hire them. Also find out what equipment they've got because the reason that people go for compartment tests, here, this middle one, the reason that people go for these sorts of tests um, are many. Obviously there's the perception that they're cheaper and easier and also it requires less equipment so there aren't many people in the country that have actually got enough equipment to do a whole building test so you need to ask that question. Um, if a person, if the tester thinks that they can actually test the whole building um, and it's, it's a bit of a problem, the industry is quite young and the equipment is expensive. Um, it, the industry is young in this country so um, that's why this kind of testing is, I guess, happening, which I guess is understandable. But we're trying to encourage people to look a bit further. Because really the point of Green Star is to create better buildings and a whole building test is the best way to actually work out how the building is performing and what you need to do about it, what you can do with that number. It gives you a, a useful number to work with. Um, the compartment tests don't. So here is a little um, graph with a few comparisons across the globe um, and where Australia sits. So again, we've got air changes and cubic metres per hour per square metre in here. Um, broadly comparable. It's just hard to talk about these, <laughs> these results because they're all different. The CSIRO study came out with 15.4 air changes across the country as an average. The UK has a um, target of 10 cubic metres per hour per square metre. Um, they, their blower door testing is a requirement, so they don't get occupancy of their homes until they have had a blower door test, a successful blower door test completed. And it can be the case where there's people in the driveway with a moving van and the blower door test fails and the people can't move in on that day. So um, <laughs> we're not quite there yet in Australia, but I can't imagine how disappointing that would be. For the poor people who are about to move in. Passive house is 0 0.6 air changes as I mentioned earlier and the Department of Defence and the Green Building Council of Australia use more or less the same guidelines. They get their targets out of the ATMA um, standard which is the UK standard for big building testing at the um, ATMA TSL2. Um, so yeah the Department of Defence and Green Building Council and Passive House are the only three organizations that require air tightness testing. It's not compulsory anywhere else. So I don't think I mentioned that actually, but here the building code stuff, it's um, it's optional. It's not compulsory yet. It's just in there as a 
optional way to verify the building ceiling section. Um, you can still go down the DTS route if you want, just ticking boxes. This way, just because I like to know, I like to know um, the number, you know, the data really interests me. So putting a number on a house gives you a lot of really useful information and obviously as in, um, energy efficiency requirements increase and building ceiling requirements increase, the risk is there that you may actually over tighten a building without realising it and not then not have a ventilation strategy to match and you could end up with all sorts of issues with indoor air quality and condensation and mould. So the build type ventilate right mantra is um, very, very important. So if you want to get an air tightness test done <clears throat> or you're thinking about having an airtight um, strategy in your next project, please get in touch with someone early. They can help you to plan and they can help you to mitigate the risks. Okay, that's all I have today. Um, we are in week seven of our Suho webinar series. We've been doing talks like this now for weeks and we've still got some time left to go. We'll be doing these um, for the next little while. So this afternoon we've got the building science of sensory space design and how um, sustainable design um, impacts um, the, the, you know, the general sensory experience within a building. We've got some information about ESD and town planning. I'm doing a couple more air tightness, um, air tightness webinars. Some stuff about the code changes which happened a couple of weeks ago now and um, heaps more. So I will go to some questions now. Let me see what we've got. Okay, frou frou, it doesn't look like there's many questions. Um, I hope, I'm sorry if I pronounced this incorrectly, Kretheka, sorry if that's wrong. I hope that that link was useful. That's, um, if you just go to our library, if that's not the right link, if you go to our library, you'll be able to find a whole heap of webinars that we've done already. And the green star one will be amongst that as well as um, a, a red pen test one, a more detailed talk about the red pen test. <coughs> okay, so I think that's it for today. Um, thank you very much for joining me, either if you were here live or if you're watching on replay. Appreciate you spending the time and I hope you learned something today and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.